All right. Peace and blessings, family. We are back in the building. Hope you're having a great day. I have the pleasure of talking with uh, an extraordinary woman named Kelly Todd Griffin. She is with Sister Let, right? Yep, yep, yep. Damn. So, y'all, look, we have we, our community is so diverse. It's full of so many awesome people. But it's very rarely that people who are in the know get to really talk to people who need to be in the know. So, thank you for stopping by to get us and put us in the know. I don't know about that, but at least <laughs> we can get in the know together. I'll take that. that. I'll take that. I'll take that. So I wanted to ask you, 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 we're going to talk about the status of black women in California. Why do we need to look at the status of black women in California? Well, I think it's important because, one, in California, 75% of our households are headed by black single mothers. So when we're talking about the black community, you can't separate the black woman and the black community, because mm -hmm. the black woman is the black community. So when we really start looking at the status of black women, we can also have some kind of foresight of what's going on in our community as well. All right, so when we're looking at that status, what are we really trying to look for? Like, what is the purpose? Well, what's the quality of life index say? So if we're talking about housing, economics, employment, you know, we're we're talking about political participation, education. All of those are quality of life indexes that we all should know kind of where are we. So we tend to, in our community, really focus on, you know, a lot of times we look at kind of the downstream impact. So we'll look at boys um, and what they're experiencing with police brutality and, you know, just the whole profiling. And at the same time, that happens to girls as well, but the the verbiage that we put out really focuses on boys. But the girls are experiencing the same thing. So what we're trying to say in the status of black women and girls is that we have to look at them as well and not just look at one part of our population. The other thing is when we're looking at women of color, we tend to also be part of that women of color umbrella. So it, it's whether we're a woman or whether we are a black person, sometimes it's hard for us to look at the fact that we are black women. And so we do have kind of that double thing that isn't a negative, it's just a double thing because we experience the things as women and we experience the things as, as being a black person in America at the same time. So it's important for us to look at those because our experience is going to be different than women of color in general and black folks in general. So it seems like in terms of education that it appears that black women are doing well in terms of obtaining degrees. Well, yes. that statistic is a little skewed. And a lot of times we use that statistic. But what it means is we had a greater percentage of black women, a growth percentage going into college. So it doesn't mean that we have more women. We still are at a small percentage of black women achieving um, bachelor degrees. Mm -hmm. And if we kind of look back a little bit and we look at, especially in California, we look at our educational achievement, we're saying at third grade, we're not at reading standard. At fifth grade, we're not at our math standard for grade level. Then we get to high school, we're not on path through meeting the A through G requirements, right? Mm -hmm. So then we come out of school and we're more likely to take remedial classes in college, meaning we're not where we need to be to be in college course courses. So then we end up having, because we are, you know, we need a little more economic assistance than other groups. Mm -hmm. So now we have school debt, we've had to go get more student loans, and then something happens something happens to our pathway to success. So we may not um, finish school, but we still have school, student debt. It took me 10 years to finish my degree. And on my journey, you know, my parents passed away. You know, I had moved. I ended up getting married. I ended up having a kid. So it, it's this journey. And so a lot of times that journey be, disrupts our education. But we, we get there. But if we have to start a little further behind our counterparts, then that, that time frame takes longer to achieve. And some of us don't even go back because it's hard to go back. So when we look at California statistics and we look at 67% of African-Americans that grad students that come out of high school go into junior college, right? But we have heard we need to go to school. We need to go to a four-year mm -hmm. college, even though the financing isn't there, right? Mm -hmm. So we go in and we get kind of these 
loans and we get the burdens and we're not even on a pathway to graduate. So it kind of hurts us. So it's not that we're not going, we're going, it's just our pathway is a little different. And if we don't have interventions that address those pathways, then we'll continue to see that kind of decline. But that's the African-American community as a whole. But now you add this overlay, this overlay that black women predominantly are head of households. Mm -hmm. So over 65% of babies born in California are born to single moms. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you're going to college, say you like, you know, you meet someone and you end up having a baby. Now you're not, you're in college, but you're a single head of household. You have to take care of all the responsibilities of the household and you're trying to go to college all at the same time. So those are the things. So that's why we talk about like universal preschool. That's why we talk about daycare. That's why we talk about, because you basically right now, 50% of black women's earnings go to housing. Another 30% go to daycare. So that's 80% now. So that's not utilities, that's not gas, that's not anything else. It's just the basic care of them and maybe their child. So then you start adding college. Well, then books are expensive. You mm -hmm. got you know, tuition that's expensive. So those are kind of dynamics that people experience, particularly black women that go into college. So it's, it's almost really kind of interesting when you hear a statistic like black women have, you know, are going to college and we're graduating at higher numbers. Mm -hmm. and it's like, well, it's almost like set up for us not to be able to do that. But we have a higher percentage of black women. The increase is higher than any other ethnic groups or our counterparts, really. Right. Meaning we get more in, but we don't get more out. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. How do you propose that we work on preparing young girls in school, right. like in those those earlier years. Well, I mean, you do a lot of work with girls, and I think you know one of the things is we have to recognize the current school system isn't working for our children. That's true. So because we look at the achievement gap, the mm -hmm. achievement gap is significant for African Americans. I was talking to a school in Los Angeles um, that you know used to be like the crown jewel of graduating the best and the brightest of African American students in high school. And now the school has changed its demographics. And so we were talking about, you know, um, graduation rates. And they were saying, well, we've gotten the graduation rates up to 80%. I said, that's awesome. So what is the achievement gap between the African-American students and the other students? And the person's response to me was, well, it's higher than LAUSD as a whole for African-American men, boys. And I said, okay. So again, what is the achievement gap because what you just said was you were higher than the district however the district is low so i'm not sure that really is something mm -hmm. that that gives me some comfort what is it and it was just blank it was like well all we know is higher than the LAUSD and then i asked well what about girls and they go we don't mm -hmm. track it so if you don't even track the fact that you have an achievement gap for girls, it's almost as if it doesn't exist. But we know it exists because they're graduating not meeting the A through G. So when you really start talking about how do our kids get from kindergarten to third grade and not be at reading level? Mm -hmm. I was listening to a debate yesterday of the gubernatorial candidate, and they talked about you know, they need to know how, so many words before they get into kindergarten, and that'll dictate success. Well, now let's overlay that statistic mm -hmm. I gave you before, when I said 75% of our households are single or headed by single black women, and they have to pay for daycare. So they're not, mm -hmm. some of them, so we have the largest group of women in poverty in the state of California uh, than our counterparts. The only group that is lower than us is American Indian and it's by like one, by 0.2%. So not a significant difference, right? Mm -hmm. Statistically significant right. difference. So we are, we head our households. We make, you know, what did we make? Uh, 63 cents to every dollar that mm. the male makes. We are the, that's the only money coming in. 
We spend 50% on rent. We spend 30% on childcare. A lot of times we have to work more than one job. Mm -hmm. And then we have kids that have to go someplace during the day. And you're saying now we need to make sure that they learn so many words before they get to kindergarten. And that mm -hmm. burden falls on many times the mother who mm -hmm. again is also carrying the load for everything else. So what does that, so how can our kids meet that goal without some type of intervention? But that's mm -hmm. why we talk about universal preschool because we know you can get there. We know our kids can get there because if, we didn't think our kids can get there, then that would mean we're accepting a theory that they can't. Mm -hmm. And that's impossible because, you know, we had, you know, hidden figures. We had Tuskegee Airmen. We had some of the greatest, you know, writers of all time during the Harlem Renaissance. Mm -hmm. We've sent people to the moon. We've sent people oh. all over the world. I mean, we've discovered, I remember working at an automotive company and I'm discovering that we, that an African-American man created the two-cycle engine. And I went to a colleague and I said, look at all these things that African-Americans did in the automotive industry. And the colleague said, that can't be right. Couldn't be right. I said, yeah, they invented the lawnmower. They did this, they did. He's like, that just can't be right. I never heard of that. It cannot be right. Mm -hmm. So I went to my boss and I said, what can we do to educate people that black folks have contributed right. in the Maybe. automotive industry? And he, he gave me this free realm to create something. And so we create this big, beautiful display with all of these patent designs. And I remember um, contacting Thermo King, which was an Afri was in, um, developed by African-American inventor. And Thermo King basically owns the patent for refrigerated cars, anything refrigerated. Mm -hmm. So at the time it was trains and now it's mm -hmm. trucks. So anytime you transport food, you need to be in a refrigerated system. Mm -hmm. What well, African-American man created that. Wow. And so he, and I remember calling Thermo King and they, the historian was like, I am so happy people are starting to discover his story because no one knows that an African-American man created this. So it's like, we know we can succeed, but the education system today, when our kids aren't succeeding, so what can we do about it? You know, the programs you do are really important. But I think it has to start earlier. I agree. I think by the time we get to high school, it's too late. Or at least it's not too late, but it takes us a lot longer to remediate mm -hmm. no, some right. of the gaps. You're right. I think middle school is too late. Right. Well, I think preschool. <laughs> That's why yeah. I want preschool. I think right. preschool. We got to start and putting them in the right, their foot in the ground to say you're competing in an international world now. And I know I have kids that I see that can do things on their phones that I could never mm -hmm. do on my phone. I'm mm -hmm. like, well, I don't know what they're doing. Or I, you know, you see them like setting up podcasts and websites and they're playing video games. Mm -hmm. I mean, these kids are brilliant, you know, but we need to figure out how do we get them to be successful in a traditional education system that really wasn't designed for us. That's true. That's true. What about, um, uh, working, do you think men or even black men would be more specifically, do you think they're pretty fair to black women? Because I see a lot of that kind well, of, you know, we usually don't get to talk about that because you don't want to come against the brothers and then people be <laughs> all on you like, why you do know? Well, you know, I'm unapologetically about black women. <laughs> and so, and I believe it's important to, for some of us to be unapologetically about black women. And I think there are many programs and organizations that are focused on black men that that should be focused on black men and black mm -hmm. and black boys. So like the, you know, the the um, my brother's keepers and, mm -hmm. you know, the different even in California, there's a select committee on um, black men and black boys. All of those things are necessary because as a community it's important to have investments across the board. Mm -hmm. The reality is I'm a mother of two boys. So I need folks and I'm a single mother. I've been a single mother for years. So I need those type of programs to invest in to my sons and the things that I can't provide for them mm -hmm. around them becoming the men that I hope that they can become and what I think God wants them to be, right? At the same time, I also believe that 
as a female and what I missed in the journey of adulthood, because my mother was one of those moms who barely made ends meet, but didn't make enough money to, mm -hmm. to do one thing, but made too much money to get any kind mm -hmm. of services. Mm -hmm. And so we moved a lot because of poverty. We, I went to eight different schools from the time that I was in kindergarten all the way to the time I was in 12th grade. My parents had this theory of as soon as you graduated high school, you are on your own regardless of your age. So for a year, I was in transitional living. There were times growing up where I lived at friends' house because my mother couldn't take care of me. So, I mean, I've seen poverty firsthand when it's a single mom without the support of the other parent or any other family members. And, you know, it's devastating to the children, but it's even devastating to the parent mm -hmm. who's doing it. My mother passed away at 43 years old. Wow. And so when you see a woman who spends only 40 years of her life on earth and all experiencing trauma, you know, how can you not want to invest in black women and black girls? Because mm -hmm. I never I want another mother to have to go through what my mother went through. I never want a little girl to live the way I lived growing up. And, you know, God surrounded me with some folks to be able to help me mm -hmm. guide through life. And I think that he had a purpose of doing that. Right. But then that means I have to also do the same. So I don't think that, you know, we're in competition with brothers. I just think it's necessary for us to also have our own journey to plant seeds into black women and black girls. Mental health. But right. all that you talked about leads directly into mental health or right. education when you can't inform or, you right. know, how you feel if, you, if you're not learning at the same rate as other right. people. Um, and then the whole thing we talked about relationships and poverty. How are we doing in the mental health field? We have a long way to go. I have a brother who's bipolar. And um, for years, he uh, struggled with um, not being diagnosed. Um, and it, when he got diagnosed, he got more stabilized just based on the correct treatment. Um, I had a mother who dealt with the trauma of poverty. And when you would see her outside, she was beautiful. She would hair done, nails done, sharp clothes. She liked to coordinate all her outfits. Right. And then she would come into our house and close the door. And that smile on the other side of the oh. door is where it was left. And she would come in and immediately her body would change. She would just slump over. She would go into her room. She would go get her wine. She would go into her room and she would drink herself to sleep. Mm -hmm. And that was her daily occurrence. And the next morning, she would wake up and she would put that mask right back on and walk over that threshold. And that's what I saw every day. That's a mother who was dealing with mental health and trauma. That's what my brother saw. And it was just undiagnosed. And it's because at the end of the day, she didn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. She had to provide for her children. Right. So she have a choice. So all the things that led up to that also led up to chronic disease, which is what she experienced um, when she passed away. Today, you know, I talk a lot about, you know, adverse childhood experiences. Pieces. So okay. when you look at trauma as a child, when kids and trauma and ACE, you know, if you have a high ACE score, then, mm -hmm. you know, it could be, you know, divorce, you know, parents that act that are substance abuse, a parent that's incarcerated. You know, all of these dynamics, poverty in itself, I believe, needs to just count for like two or three by by itself, right? Because all the things that, you know, involve poverty, you know, environmental issues, all kinds of stuff. And, you know, they're more likely to have chronic diseases as an adult. But when you look at black women in California, 80% of us are insured, whether we're insured mm -hmm. through Medi-Cal, Medicare, public or uh, private employee, but we have the we have the highest percentage of chronic disease um, than any other group. Mm -hmm. And we have the highest percentage of mar mortality mm -hmm. than any other group for chronic disease. So we have insurance. So we the other stuff we don't do. And, and you know, again, back to my mother, my mother 
um, was 43 years old. She was taking care. We were gone. So me and my brother were out the house, but she was still trying to hold it down. Um, and she got to a point in her disease where it was so bad, so bad that she um, had to go to the hospital because she just felt like she couldn't lift another finger or do anything. But she didn't want to go to a hospital where they saw black and brown people. Because in her mind, she didn't think she was going to get quality care. Mm -hmm. So instead, she goes to a hospital in Anaheim Hills where she thought she would get better care. Now, she's insured and really good insurance. Mm -hmm. So she goes to Anaheim Hills. They discount her symptoms and tell her, because you remember, in an emergency room, all they have to do is stabilize you. Mm -hmm. They take an HIV test, but they don't do any other blood work. They send her home. She goes home. She says, I'm exhausted. I just want to go to sleep. She goes to sleep, goes in a diabetic coma, and mm. never wakes up. So the so that story hits so many elements about black women. Way to the to get to fatal state to take care of yourself, even though you have insurance. Mm -hmm. Then you don't want to get care where you see us because you don't think they're going to respect you. So you assume you get better care someplace else. They discount your 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 symptoms because mm -hmm. they you're not bleeding, and then you go home and you still don't go to your doctor. You just go home and you go to sleep, mm. right? Exhausted. But she was at a fatal stage, right? So all of this is is could have been one test mm -hmm. to see if she had diabetes, one blood test. She would have been able to live with diabetes and change her diet and be healthy. But that, but her circumstance, her story is a story of so many black women, which is why we have higher chronic disease. So those are the reasons why we have to focus on ourselves. We have to do interventions. Because again, if 75% of us are taking care of the black households, we can't afford to lose any more sisters over chronic disease or the quality of their life be substandard because they're trying to manage a chronic disease, it impacts us in a very significant way. So I know even with the ACEs, I, mm -hmm. I do a lot with that survey, and I even survey like my friends and I'm with older women or whatever, and a lot of people score high on them. I mean, yeah. people who do really brilliant work, some of my friends were brilliant, they're like, oh my God, I got a 10. Right. I've been with someone where they shared that with their mom, and it was like, what? Because right. they had taken, it's like, I didn't know that happened. Like those things come out, but I also see, it feels like sometimes we normalize, mm -hmm. like that's a, that's a, part of being black yeah is for people to cuss at you and, right i mean you know i was just was surprised like is this on the survey or when i service my, my black girls in my schools here and i also work in the bay area and marine county and so i'm with a lot of people who are not black and their scores are not nearly as high right. as ours right. right you know what i mean how we help to make how we educate people so that we don't think that that's normal because it feels like we normalize right. some things in culture because of the trauma and and centuries of trauma like we right. think that's a part of being black is to call you an mf -er. like you know what right. i mean well no like <laughs> my name. but how do you propose when you when we look at that with the status of black women how to not normalize that or to right. break out of it well, I think it goes back to the work that you're doing. I know it's the work that, you know, I try and do, which is the whole mentorship in showing there are other options um, in how we communicate. My parents just weren't cursing parents. But, right. you know, I had a guy mama that I would call you an MF or in a heartbeat. <laughs> and so, you know, in a way that, you know, more if she got upset and angry, right. but in on a normal conversation, she wouldn't. You know, but I do think that, you know, our expression of frustration um, is something that's just derived from the trauma we've experienced, you know, mm -hmm. but power is in words and particularly with kids. I watch, you know, a little boy and a little girl and, you know, a grandmother and how she treats the little boy is different than how she treats the little girl. And so you treat the little boy as a king and you treat the little girl as, you know, stop being sassy. She's always into something. Words are really powerful. And a lot of times when the girls get older, that that stuff manifests. You mm -hmm. know, it's just growing up, understanding you're brilliant. You know, I have niece, I have a niece that and a nephew that are just really good, has always been really good looking kids. And since everybody else focused on their beauty, I always focused on their brains. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that balance has to happen. I don't 
technically need anyone to tell me I'm beautiful, but I love when people say you're, I'm smart and that I'm brilliant or I, I have, you know, things to offer society. And those are the things I think we have to put into our kids is that you come from kings, queens, inventors, scientists. You know, I grew up in LAUSD, well, really LA, because I went to so many different schools, but different, but we didn't study black history at all. We, you know, we talked about Martin Luther King once, but that, that's it. But we didn't study. And I remember watching the Cosby show. And I remember the Vanessa character mentioning uh, Langston Hughes. And I'm in college. So I was like, well, who's this Langston Hughes guy? So I go to the college library and I look at for the section. And here's this whole section on books about black people and by black people. And I started like checking books out over and over. And at the time it was during apartheid. So there's like this whole, you know, thing going on anyway around, you know, understanding who you are black. And I, I had flunked out of college because I was, you know, run behind some dude. Anyways, I flunked <laughs> out of college. I flunked out of college and um, my uncle came down and my uncle said, enough. You, you're coming up to San Francisco. And my uncle was a professor at San Francisco State. Uh, and he told me, you have way too much to offer society for you to be, you know, flunking out of school and doing all this crazy stuff. So he took me to San Francisco, and they have a program called Step to College. And mm -hmm. you basically, to, even today, you can go and take this class in high school, um, Intro to Black Studies, Intro to uh, La Raza Studies, at the time it was Chicano Studies, Intro to women says, and you take this class for one semester, and you automatically get entry into San Francisco State. Wow. And this program still exists today. And he ran this program. So I went as like a 20-year-old into this class with these uh, teenagers, with these high school students. And I took this class. And it's class after school. Took this class. And that's how I got into San Francisco State. Because wow. my grades was not going to get me into San Francisco <laughs> State. I may have even let some grades go, like, we're not even going to claim that school because right. my grades there, they, they just would be like, no, no, I, I, you know, because then they didn't have computers, so right. everything was paper. So, so I actually um, went to, so I went into Black Studies Department, uh, and that became my major, and I mm -hmm. just, I, and a lot of the teachers were, you know, former civil rights leaders, you know, like Oba Tashaka and Dr. Wade wow. Nobles. And I started working for Oba Tashaka. I started working for Wade Nobles. And I just, and I remember just this, all of this information. It was like information I became, I'm walking around with, you know, the souls of black folks and mm -hmm. all this stuff. And my white friends would be like, what is that book doing? I was like, listen, girl, I'm all about, I'm, you know, got an Africa, <laughs> you know, I'm walking around with Birkenstocks. I'm really living <laughs> my black dream, right? right? right. So, so, you know, joining the black student units, doing all of that. But it was because I had such a thirst because I was so deprived of what, who we are and what we could do. And I think a lot of that trauma we experience is because we are looking at lens of what normal is in the majority society mm -hmm. of society and not so much what normal is in our society. Violence absolutely shouldn't be normalized. Mm -hmm. But the way that we talk, engage, and, and do things, like Zora Neale Hurston is my favorite writer mm -hmm. because the rhythm of her words really makes sense to me. You know, and so mm -hmm. you really, you know, I don't think we have to change. I just think we have to also add stuff to it to showcase, you know, how this makes sense, you know? Mm -hmm. What about in violence? Black women and then the whole violent. Some people, I like the way they use the term violent culture. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you could be in the midst of things and it yeah. really does feel like a culture. Yeah. Where are we at it there? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I love um, Genesee, Genesee down in Los Angeles with Karen Earl, and I talk to her often. I think she's phenomenal. And, you know, one of the things we talk about is how we're seeing it earlier and earlier. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to see young girls. Um, thinking that is how love is is displayed mm -hmm. is if you know you have the trauma that the young men are experiencing and the girls are seeing how their mothers or grandmothers aunts and cousins are mm -hmm. are in relationships and so they think that is love so when the boys mm -hmm. are coming with all of their anger and try I remember when we would see 
a boy hit a girl in school, we would all be like ready to roll, you know, right. earrings coming off. We ready to take them down. <laughs> but to you know, now we're starting to see where you know people think that is what love is in in mm -hmm. certain parts of the community. Again, there's always just a small part. That's crazy, probably of the community, not so much the larger part of the community, because I don't think any of us, um, hey beautiful, mm -hmm. I don't think any of us believe violence is normal. I, I don't think any I culture believes violence is normal. I just believe that we have gotten to a place where when we see violence, um, it gets, you know, kind of elevated and everyone says that is, come here Christy, that is, have a seat. That, you know is how we do it. Right. that is how we do it. our, um, <laughs> that is kind of how it represents us, but that's not true because here we have a room full of black women yep. and we, none of us experience violence. Mm -hmm. Have you, not directly. No, yeah. not directly. <laughs> no, because they wouldn't even be that. But I can't. Police violence, though. Yeah, so we're yeah. talking about relationship yeah. violence. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. No. But I learned that from my mother. Right. Because she so, had domestic violence. Yes. Yeah. And so did my mother. Yeah. With my father. Right. Right. <laughs> my mother had some mental health during my piece. She would knock my dad out. But I think right. people do things mentally to mess with your piece. Yes. You know, like, you're a woman. You're supposed to be able to do, you know. Right. What? Right. I think that's why I'm like, what? Right. You got me twisted. Right. But <laughs> you can mess with my piece if you want to, but we're going to be right. peaceful together. That's what I'm going to say. It's like, well, now it's on. And I'm like, oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Jesus said it. Brother's alive. It's all better. Yes, don't like, make it to take the earrings off. That means you just got it. No, 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 when we get quiet. Right. No, when we get true. quiet. That's a problem. Right. I know That's for me, yeah. I can't just going down. We don't got nothing else to talk about. Right. No more negotiating. Right. Right. So, right. so let me let me throw this in there. So I know we talked about that. What about the impact of reality TV shows on young people? I'll tell you, I was in sixth graders yesterday, fifth grade. They were talking about bucking. I didn't know what bucking What's was. Bucking? That's what I'm saying. Well, it's, well, it's the dancing dolls. Yes. The dancing dolls. <laughs> and so. I was, but these it's are girls also, who are in the third. Too, yeah, no, they they talking about bucking the dancing dolls. Oh. So these are uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. Uh -huh. And um, I think I was just shocked because I was first day going this. I said, like, oh, you know, I, I didn't, you know, like I let them do the dance, and then we talked about the impact. Like, what's the origins of that dance? Yes. Okay. And what's the origins of dancing yeah. dolls in terms of the way the girls come dressed and do they look like they're young girls doing the dance or do they look like uh you know like adult women doing the dance and we explained that and some of the girls even said they don't buck in front of their parents and they kind of do it and in, in, you know and so i allow young people to be free enough to talk to me but it's kind of like but that's something that they learn from us uh, mm -hmm. as adults mm -hmm. and so how much do you think the impact the reality tv show has on our well-being as black women not all of us but i mean in terms of us emulating girls, some of the stuff. Girls really and grown women. I know some grown women who would not miss an episode and then try to like this well, what they did on it. I'm like, well, I'm that? guilty. I watch every ratchet show reality show. TV <laughs> show. But for me, for me, it is it's the, entertainment. It so is entertainment yeah. for me. I also work with young people. I want to know what's going on. And it's entertaining to me, right? But I definitely see it as problematic. There are a lot of things that are on reality. The TV that I definitely think impact our young girls, but I also don't think it's just the TV, reality TV. I think it's the music. I mm -hmm. think it's the combination of all these things mm -hmm. happening all at right. one time. So I think it's the music. I think it's the TV. I also think it's what's happening in their schools. I also think it's like what's happening in our communities. It's like all that's all they see. Yeah, there's nothing that goes else. back to your normal. Mm -hmm. So I think that's more normalized than you know, the other things like violence in terms of, you know, right. male, female violence. Right. No, what's normalized is that you can be, you know, a stripper, you know, have a potty mouth and, you know, wear all kinds of revealing stuff and you can be a superstar. Um, but mm -hmm. it's no more different than boys seeing, you know, I want to be like LeBron or I want to be like, I mean, that's like, this is the only pathway to success. And that's where I think that's we have to work on it is saying you don't have to act a certain way to be able to be, you know, 
loved, appreciated, and successful, that you can be brilliant. It goes back to, it's not wrapped around your looks. It's wrapped around, you know, what you can contribute to society. And you don't have to be on a pole to contribute to society. That's not the only pathway. So what reality TV has done, in my mind, was make it seem like these are the only ways we can be successful. Mm -hmm. And this is what beauty standards are mm -hmm. um, for our community, which isn't true. Um, and that's why we have to always come in and show the difference of beauty standards. I mean, I'm from Los Angeles, so, you know, we grew up in La La Land. And mm -hmm. so there's, you know, all kind of beauty. And my sister mm -hmm. and I were talking about it. It's like, you know, in L.A., it wasn't, you know, we grew up and it wasn't that, you know, I don't, we, we weren't that typical LA girl, you know, you had to have a, you know, certain type of hair, you had to be, a, it was like a complete package in LA. It wasn't mm -hmm. like, oh, well, you can just have really long hair and be cute, or you can just be this complexion. Mm -hmm. It was like, you needed to be bam, 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 bam. And if you didn't meet those standards, you were not going to be cute. So we kind of grew up as tomboys. So we played basketball. I remember getting in mm. cars with guys. They'd be like, God, you got to smell like boys. You know, I mean, it was like, it was, it was like, well, I just got to play. Oh, dude. You know, and so we, you know, we didn't like grow up with these kind of superficial, you know, things. We were more like the guys girls. So we didn't, we didn't grow up. We didn't see beauty the way that I think other people saw beauty until you know we we started exposing ourselves to other folks like she travels internationally so beauty for her is going to look so much different mm -hmm. because she does so much international and you travel international so mm -hmm. you know that i also went to hbcu right and, then and HBCU. i was the standard so yeah that was something that i think because we see different reflections of what blackness and beauty mm -hmm. looks like here on the west coast mm -hmm. like when you go yeah. to the east coast and when you go to the yeah. south it's totally different i was the flavor of the month <laughs> 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 so and that's another thing that i always say like our girls don't get to see the variety right, exactly. and like and even when you talked about the different pathways to success. Mm -hmm. You don't even get to see the varieties of the pathways of success. Sure, right. There's so many things that you can be doing. Right. I also like the fact that because of the internet, I mean, that has good, that's pros and cons with that too. Mm -hmm, yeah. There's a lot of exposure to being an entrepreneur yeah. and how you can do be a blogger and a writer, like all these different things. And I think we just need to make sure that there's a complete exposure and not just these limited ones of like right. what's on reality TV, what is mm -hmm. the music that you're listening to, what's you know, the movies that you yes, see, yes. you know, what books are you reading, you know, those, it's like now today I don't read any books, but when I was, you know, I, or I read a, like half a book, then I'm like, I think I got it. Um, <laughs> I'm like, I got that. Um, <laughs> but I read, I'm like a news junkie. And so I, you know, I'm a, I love information. So you have to still feed me through a bunch of information, a lot of data. I'm always okay, looking at reports. Yes, I love the data. <laughs> I look at a lot of reports and everything. But growing up, I didn't know anyone like me. You know, I knew that I love to tell stories. And, you know, so when I, you know, my background is marketing and communications. And so when I look at, you know, what marketing and communication, it really is just telling stories, mm -hmm. right? You're telling mm -hmm. stories to, to get someone to do something, whether it's to buy something, to, to go someplace, to do that. Well, who better tell storytellers than black women? But right. yet, if I go to conferences, I'm still usually the only one there. So exposing our girls to Christy's point of things that, you know, may not be normal. I remember growing up wanting to be a teacher, wanted to, what I oh, saw, yeah. you know, it's like whatever I saw, that's what I wanted to be. And so this discovery of who I am today it was because I started seeing people or someone exposed me. I had a cousin, Latanya, and I was in Texas going back to school, didn't really know what I wanted to do. And she said, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, I want to do this, not marketing, but kind of social science and marketing. She goes, oh, well, maybe it's PR. And I go, well, what's, what's that? Mm. And so she said, let me give you a book. And she gave me a book by Terry Williams, um, The Personal um, Touch. And I read the book in like two hours. I mean, it was just like boom, 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 boom. And I said, aha, 
this is what I want to do. And I went into the college catalog because I was in school. And lo and behold, it was a journalism degree with a specialty in public relations. And I kid you not, I finished school in two semesters after that. I mean, it took wow. me nine years of did to do, did to do, did to do. <laughs> and when I realized what I really wanted to do, it was like focus, dig in, get out. And it was literally the day I graduated our our high school graduate our high school reunion ten years to that day. And wow. so it was like that was my path, but it was because I wasn't exposed. I was exposed to a nurse. I was exposed to, you know, my mom was an accountant, you know, but not like an accountant, not a CPA. She did accounts payable, accounts receivable. Right, right. So <laughs> let's be clear. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But I used to like to say she was an accountant. Because <laughs> it found it better, you know, it lifted her up. What she made when she died, I go, she was not an accountant. <laughs> and you know, and my dad, you know, he worked with AT&T and you know, McDonald Douglas because back then that was the industry in LA. Mm -hmm. And so he was a, a labor organizer and everything. So it was just you just didn't see a lot of people in in high positions and in offices. And my aunt, you know, was a her and her husband got their PhDs before they were 30, and one was the president of Compton Community College, and the other one was a principal at um, Linwood High School. So I thought education, got to do education because that's the pathway to leadership. Mm -hmm. That's how you get to leadership. Never would I ever imagine that I would work for Fortune 500 companies, you know, like American Honda, you know, Centene, the companies that I'm that I work for, or that I would ever work for the Speaker of the State Assembly, mm -hmm. Karen Bass. Never mm -hmm. through this one little degree called journalism, public relations. Never in my wildest dreams that I think I could get to those because I didn't see it. I just didn't see it. Y'all, if you're watching us, we've been joined by Christy Ketchum. This is my, this is my people right here. No, and we're still sister talking. Circle. Yeah. Oh, Sister Circle. Definitely, definitely. Christy, we were talking a little bit about violence. And I know in your area, um, how do you think black women are being impacted by violence, in, at least in California? We, numbers, we exceed in every area in violence. We are repeat um offended by violence and victimized by violence. Um, violence is actually something that is continuously around us, even when we're not being violated, right? So it's something that we constantly have to think about every time we walk out the door is your safety. There's never a time, I feel, as a Black woman where you can ever think, you don't have to think about your safety. That is a very different reality that we have than others do. Um, we're impacted by domestic violence. We're impacted by community violence. And then also we're impacted by what's happening with our sons and our daughters and all of that. All of that is being, we're encompassed with all of that all, all the time, right? And so we don't talk about it though like that. Like we're not looked at the victim. So if you talk about who's a victim, it's a, it's a white woman, right? But we exceed every statistic in every demographic, we exceed being victimized by crime and violence. And so uh, I've been doing a lot of work in the last few years to make sure that we are part of those conversations because crime survivors, um, they are not, we, we don't participate in that work. First of all, we don't want to look at ourselves as a victim. We don't never want to think about ourselves as victims. Um, we're not participating in those conversations. People are making laws and things about us, for us, without any of our feedback. And so it's just, it's it's something that is seriously impacting our, our community. And we also know that trauma and stress also mm -hmm. comes along with those things, right? And we're not, we're not getting the assistance, the healing, the help, the services, the resources by any way, shape, or form. And it's really, really a problem. And it's something that we definitely need to, to focus on. So now that brings me back to your gathering that you're pulling together, these women on mm -hmm. the status of black women. Um, what is that about? So what we've decided to do, and Christy's involved on our planning committee, um, what we decided to do was look at the data. Because yesterday we had a planning committee and one of the, Ramona Bishop had mentioned, you know, the data is clear for black men and black boys because we elevate that data. What we haven't done is really elevated the data of black women and girls 
So we get into this conversation, well, are you separating yourself? Or what are you doing? And the reality is, no, what we're saying is that if you look at our data too, you, you kind of see there's some need for the interventions that Chris is talking about on a lot of those quality of life indexes. Yeah. So, because when we look at, you know, women of color, then, and we're seeing women of color improve their quality of life indexes, we're seeing black women's quality of life index either stay the same or go down. Mm -hmm. When we look at um, the black community, even if you see, you know, us staying standard, because I do not believe our quality of life has increased. I was, you know, part of Karen Bass's team when we produced the state of black California. My job was to work with the professors at UC um, Berkeley and UCLA to gather the data, look at the data, assess the data, and then my job was to make the data tell the story. And then the Capitol staff created the non-legislative and legislative um, kind of um, um, priorities around the data. And we also did, my job is also to do all the town hall meetings to get that qualitative data, not just using quantitative data. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at blacks across, you know, we did that in 2006, 2007, and we look at the quality of life of black people mm -hmm. um, from then till now, we really aren't seeing a lot of movement in any of those areas. But when you kind of aggregate black women, you actually are seeing them go further down because at that mm -hmm. time, we, we weren't the, we didn't have the highest percentage of poverty um, across all of the our counterparts. I mean, Latinas were lower than us. You know, there was some API and Pacific Islanders specifically that was a little lower than us. You know, American Indian was lower than us. But for us to be now, you know, statistically at the bottom, hmm. you know, that tells us that something went wrong. Yep. Something is happening that we can't get moved from one spot to the next. But there's intersections. So you can't just look at it as this is about jobs or this mm. is about, you know, our income. This is about equality. It's not about anything else but, you know, equality. And what we're seeing is all of these intersections with the trauma of being a single parent and watching our sons and our brothers and our fathers be profiled and and shot and, and, our and, and our daughters, but, but, and we're the ones, and one of the things we've talked about on a call is like, when we talk about um, bail reform, which is a big issue right mm -hmm. now, right? Mm -hmm. Well, when a, when someone goes to jail and they have to pay mm -hmm. for bail and they can't afford it, they stay in jail. Now let's add the, the lens of black women. Mm -hmm. Again, going back to the initial statistic of 75% of our households are being headed by black women, right? So if a black woman gets arrested for whatever reason, and she is that head of household, regardless of if you can find kinship care, immediately those babies go into, the, into protective service okay. until they can determine if there's someone else that can take care of the children. If a man, while this woman is getting through bail, right? So it devastates that family, right? Because no child should have to go into any protective service for any reason because it's just not healthy. It's and another our, our children, children go to care more. Children. Yeah, they don't mm -hmm. let them wait at the station until somebody come pick mm -hmm. them up. They call child protective services and, and have them come in. When a black man goes in or any other person so that this isn't a black and they don't they don't have that dynamic. They don't have that additional stress. Their families aren't pull, pulled apart like that. And then when the women come out of jail, there's a couple of things you have to do to get your children back. You have to have a job. You have to have housing. But if it's a felony, then you it's hard to get a job, which is why band the box is important. Mm -hmm. If you, you know, housing, you can't get into um, public housing with a felony. All of those things can't are, go to school. Can't go to school. Can't get federal. Can't get student loans. Mm -hmm. So all those things. So there's it's, over five thousand right things that you you can't do. that you can't participate. You can't choose. Uh -huh. So then, how can you get your children back? So that so then when we start looking at you know how women experience going to prison and how men experience going to prison, mm -hmm. both devastating. But women devastates the family because back to the statistics of seventy five percent of us are head of household. Mm -hmm. And then the other part of that is though is when our sons and our brothers and our husbands and partners yeah. go to go to prison, we're the ones that are footing the bills, right? Yeah. So yeah. we're also paying 
helping to tell their, their bell. Yeah. The telephone does must not even go to what's what's happening with the telephone. Right. Like all the of money those, on the, the money on the books, like all of that, like that all comes back. <laughs> right. Comes back. While again, we're making sure. 63 cent to every dollar of, of our account of, of a white male. And on top of that, we have more women in service level positions than other groups as well. So you there is no extra money to be made, you know, without, again, removing yourself out of the house and now universal preschool matters because if you're at work the whole time or all day kindergarten that's another thing you know how can i you know take half a day off to you know or work half a day when i'm already making 63 cent less than everybody else, you know that's 63 so cent so i have to you know work and then my babies can't go to half day school without paying for daycare so all those that's the policy intersection but that's what i mean the state of black women is really not about one thing. It's about the intersections the thing, yeah. of everything. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have some solutions around and some low hanging fruit solutions and some really long term solutions, then we will not see the black community get improved mm -hmm. because we got to invest in some of the things that matter. And then in terms of our political participation, you know, everyone mm -hmm. knows we did the form. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Melanie Shelby was leading the charge with a host of black women on um, the planning committee. And when you're asking candidates, you know, what are you going to do about this? What are you going to do? And they're not even aware that those are the issues, right? Because we haven't even on the radar. We're not even on the radar. And but we that's why the data is so important because if you just say yeah yeah this is our experience you know it can be discounted but if we go yeah this is our experience and as you see the data says this 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 and this and the experience is also validating the data the experience is saying this is what the i experience every day when i'm trying to just keep a roof over my baby's head food in the refrigerators clothes on their back when they're when they walk home from school because I can't get off, um, mm -hmm. I worry until they get home. These are the things that we are dealing with, and we're talking seven year olds because right. they can I can't leave. They have to walk, and then they're also exposed to all of the environmental issues that that also entails. So when you look at the data, what is going to be the outcome? So the, what should we be looking for? So the whole goal of bringing the hundred black women together from throughout California, from all walks of life and levels and experiences and subject matter experts, is to look at the data and actually come out with a strategic political platform and an agenda. Whether you are um, working with elected officials, whether you're working as a community-based organization, that we will have this this kind of open data source for you to have the data at your fingertips so you can have some recommendations if you are um, investing in youth and there's some best practices out there. This isn't a one-time deal. This is really to be able to add value to the discussion, add data to the discussion. So when we're talking about funding, um, particularly of programs, you know, it's no more about just the experience. It's also about, well, this is, we know there's a gap. So if we have a foundation that's funding, you know, enrollment or they're really funding healthcare and they're talking enrollment, well, we're saying, well, we're, it's not so much about insurance for us. It really is about outcomes for us around chronic disease. It's about if I'm a mother and I only have so many PTO days and I have kids and the school is saying, your baby has a fever, you need to come get them and you can't bring them back for another 24 hours. And I only got, you know, two PTO days. And then you need to also go take them to the doctor and get a note when they come back to make sure that they don't have anything. And the doctor can't see you. So you go to emergency and then you're in emergency just to get the note all that time you're away from work. And then you want, then we're trying to say, well, now we need you to go to the doctor and get yourself checked. Well, the reality is I have to save all my time for my children. I don't have extra time for me. So, mm -hmm. you know, those are the things that we want to talk about. Those are the things that we want to educate people on, that we want to make sure that folks know that one, you're not alone. Two, there are programs out there. And three, we're gonna collectively 
you know, advocate and everyone is welcome to advocate with us. All we're trying right. to do is just make sure that we flushed out the data and we flushed out and that the we're opportunity. on the radar and we're, that on we're the having right. the conversations that we have a plan. Right. That we're being strategic right. and thinking about and that we can do this together. Yeah. You know, because there's these, you know, there's a lot of times people say black women can't work together. Are you serious? I mean, oh, not true. we work together yeah. well, you know, I, and so we have no all choice but to work with right. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's all we're right, for. and we we can breathe, and but it also gives our girls and our to see how we care that much about their future that we want to put this work because everyone's volunteer. We have no corporate sponsorship. We have, I mean, Sierra Health Foundation has really stepped up to give us the location. Their staff is helping. The Black Child Legacy Kendra is working with us on this, but we have folks in LA, you know, like I mentioned, Genesis, we have um, um, Elaine Batcher, the CEO of Martin Luther King Hospital. We have Kimberly Ellis, you know, who has literally transformed the California Democratic Party um, coming. We have Desi Woods um, Jones, who was the founder of Black Women Organized for Political Action. I mean, we have some powerhouses coming into this Holly, space. Senator Holly we have Mitchell. Holly Mitchell coming to bring <laughs> greetings. I mean, you know, we, you know, Chip from Sierra Health Foundation, we wanted to make sure that we were talking to all of the folks that have the same passion that we have around improving the lives of black women and girls in the state of California. Do you think um, uh, in this climate of number 45, do you think more people are opening their eyes? I just said number 45. Mm -hmm. Do you think Me people too. are being more aware? It's like, ooh. Do you think it's making more people be more aware, like making more aware, like I have to do something, I can't really sit on the side like I did with the last eight years or like somebody else gonna take care of it? Well, for me, I, you know, I've been aware since I started working with Karen Bass, because I, I have to be honest, you know, when I got the call for Karen Bass, I was in Atlanta doing the Honda Battle of the Bands, and I um, I actually was one of the, the people that helped launch Honda Battle of the Bands at American Honda, so I'm thinking, I'm good, I'm all black. And so, <laughs> so the, you know, Esty Sepulveda, who, you know, is a, a powerhouse in her own right, used to work for Feinstein, too, she called me to schedule this interview, and I was like, she said, Dad, I want you to come in, in with Karen Bass, and I said, oh, okay, and I was like, well, who is this lady, and let me see if she's even a Democrat, and so, <laughs> and, then I, and then I was like, and what is an assembly member, you know, I mean, that, I didn't, let's talk about that, right, I didn't even know that, you know, I had no idea what that was, you know, and so, I, it's, you know, I, it, I believe politics is local, I just believe that wholeheartedly. Um, I want to make sure that the community that I live in is thriving. Um, but I understand the roles of the federal, the state, you know, but city is so important to me um, and county. It's, I mean, especially mm -hmm. in the work that, that we do, you know, when we talk about foster care and we're talking about, you know, homeless, crime, crime yeah. that is so local. local. And so, um, and so there's, to me, um, it's the responsibility is really for us to focus locally on the issues that are important to us um, and advocate for those issues with the people that are sharing our neighborhoods with us, which is the local folks. You know mm -hmm. that if I'm driving down the street by Bel Air and I hit a pothole, so is that city council member. So I'm going to call her and say, listen, lady. There's some potholes here that should not be here. And we pay for well, all we of that with our tax, tax money. Dollars. This is not like they're giving us yes, anything, yes. right? So I definitely think with 45B in, in position, um, there's a there's more awareness. But it's very frustrating, though, for me, because I feel like a lot of people don't know how government works. How government works. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And how people just, some people just will argue up and down why they shouldn't vote, right? And still, we're having that same conversation after so many fall and die for us to have that have that opportunity. And so for me, I think it's a time for study. Yeah. So that for me, I've been thinking a lot more about like, because we have, we're educated, we're brilliant, we're doing well and thriving in a lot of ways, right? But in regards to us understanding the, the political process, process right. we mm -hmm. have no, no clue. And these are people with masters and PhDs and everything else. And they've never really saw themselves being involved in the political process, right? They never saw a need to be. Um, or they consider themselves agitators. 
And if they consider themselves agitators, it's the, it's this, then I want to be anti, but I'm not voting for, you know, mm. you guys are falling in, the, you know, the traps of, mm. but the reality mm. is we are a representative government. And so we vote, we're not a democratic um, government. We vote for people to represent us. And yes. so if we're not voting for people, so it's not one vote, one person, and we're not that which is democratic. And that's even that education for people to believe that we, you know, my vote, one vote, it, it, no, we are voting for people to represent us. And if we're voting for people to represent us, then we should make sure that they understand what it is that we want. And, and that's our responsibility. That's our responsibility. And by putting people in that align with the things that we believe in. So we can't all be at every meeting. We can't, but we don't even want to go and ask questions. It's like, well, how, you know, I noticed you did this legislation, but when it was all done, it was gutted, you know, so, uh -huh. it, but you had a press conference when you, when you, issue when you submitted the legislation so how now did it gut it and it doesn't represent what you said it was when you asked us all to show up at your press conference and sit with you along the steps to say yeah 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 we're going to address you know you know after school care and then when we see the end because we don't follow that process to okay. christy's point you got to mm -hmm. follow that all the way through. You can't just say, okay, we got, we were there we're and he there. knows our we issues. Voted. Yeah, we're voted. Good. It's a whole process. And again, it wasn't until I started working for an elected that I, I mean, cause I wasn't, I was totally not clueless. I didn't even know the value of voting that way. Even though my grandparents voted, I just think my mom just was, just dealing with her own stuff. It wasn't something she passed down to me. Right. Mm -hmm. But understanding that that vote impacts women in poverty, you know, that it does, it can help, it can harm <laughs> if we're not educated. You know, I mean, I think eight years we had, um, you know, a, a president that was, you know, was awesome. And we love that imagery of having someone, you know, in a place of that statue. But at the same time, when you look at California, we, we had less and less black women win, winning some of these big seats. Mm -hmm. However, good news is we have more than 100 black women that are in elected offices in the state of California. And we have a, a, a host of new um, black women that are running for office, yes. not just here in Sacramento, but oh, throughout the whole country. state. Because we are engaged a little more. We are saying that we can't just sit behind everybody. And when people say, well, who are you going to vote for? It's not our vote. It's our political participation. So we need to change that dynamic because we don't just vote. We actually phone bank. We go knocking on doors. We get other people to support you. Those are the things that matter to us. Those are the things that matter to elected officials. So if we if we pull all that back, or if you just think about the next generation, if they're not seeing the results of us walking and phone banking, then you're gonna lose that, that consistent bank of support that is known as black women. Today, mm -hmm. if you don't, if you don't show that the work we're doing is also improving the lives in current situations or the quality of life indexes of our community because we're doing all this work in our community we're not seeing we're suffering and we're you, dying yeah we're dying we're dying but yet we're we're right there and we're on stage with folks we're cheering them on we gripping we're grinning we get invited to some really cool meetings and events but we're dying the other so thing that I addressing. yeah, the other thing that I wanted to say is that I think we're beyond the the place where people that look like us, you're automatically getting our vote. Yes. Like for me, like I'm sorry, I won't even say names, but there are several people that I know that are elected officials that look like me. They're black men mostly that I I don't feel deserve our vote. And I think when we put this this forum that we're putting together. I think I can say more than why I'm not, I can tell you why I'm yes. not giving you my vote. Right, right. Because and you I'm going to give you the opportunity right. to get on board with what affects my life right. and my community and my right. family's life. Right. And I think that's the, the piece that has been missing. Yeah. We haven't had that plan. Even we missed that opportunity, in my opinion, with Obama. Mm -hmm. Because it was like, mm -hmm. we want him to do this for black people. Well, what do black people want? Mm -hmm. Where is the where is the strategic and action plan? Where right. what is the ten points? What is the right. what is it? And right. we were never able to produce that. 
And that's because we haven't been a part of the political process and we don't know how it right. works. And I do see that now people are opening their eyes and I'm very hopeful that we're getting more engaged. Right. And I do think that there was some effort around, um, there was some effort even when we were the last eight years. The, the difference is we didn't make it hyper local. We didn't hyper target down to the local. Because at mm -hmm. the end of the day, you know, what works in New York is not going to work right. in, in California. What works in Sacramento is not going to work in L.A. You know, if you mm -hmm. just look at health care alone, there's public hospitals in L.A. and Oakland and in, um, in San Francisco. There's no public hospitals in the Inland Empire and Fresno mm -hmm. and Sacramento. So when you're trying to talk about the health care delivery system, it's going to look different Very in different. each area. There's a, a, a FQHC model in LA that doesn't exist here in Sacramento. So when you are that high up and you're designing policy that high up, then it's going to be, you know, kind of the lowest common denominator, right? What can we all agree to? Mm -hmm. Our goal where we missed some of our boats was really bringing it down locally to say, okay, now how is this going to look in Sacramento mm -hmm. and not just Sacramento County, but how's this going to look in Sacramento City and not just Sacramento City, how's this going to look in District 6? Yeah. And so that's why that local is so important, because if you don't take policy and make sure that your area of focus in, is being addressed for your for your geographic spread, mm -hmm. then policy is only going to do the bare minimum. Right. And we're not participating in any of those conversations. Right. We're not but, we, voting. but we have to. And I think and that is to. the key to what we're trying to do is say, no more are we just going to sit on the sidelines or sit in the background. We want to now participate. And we don't want to participate with window dressing. We want to actually participate. And we're going to actually hold you accountable for that moving forward. Yeah. And so regardless of, and I say that even with candidates. You know, I support black women candidates financially because I believe they shouldn't have a barrier financially. Yeah. They should have an opportunity to share their story. So that's the, as that's, a participate, as in, a the participate in the process. And finances is usually the barrier. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have my vote. What yeah. because I still need to know you're gonna represent the things that I need you to represent that that I believe in, right? Because we still need to hold people accountable, regardless if they're African-American. Of course, I want more black women in leadership. Of course, I want more black women to be elected in key positions and to get, you know, like Holly Mitchell's the first African-American to ever be over the Senate Budget Committee. Mm -hmm. Karen Bass, first African-American woman to ever serve over a state legislative body in the nation. You know, and I remember when she got sworn in and I watched those people that used to work, that have been working at the Capitol for years up in the galley that that t walked away from their job, those hourly workers, walked away just to see her get sworn in because it was so monumental. Mm -hmm. And so, and but there's only one Holly, there's only one Karen, there's only one Barbara, there's, a, you know, so we got to have more of us. And one of the things we talk about a lot is, Okay, so who is the bench? And so if we say, okay, we want more black women, but we got to make sure those black women are also ready because it can't be to Chrissy point, just because you're a black woman doesn't necessarily mean That's you're going to jump into the role. But then we, and we also know people that right. are black yeah. men and black, black women, women. Yep. that don't do us any, any service, service at right? all. They at don't all. even align with what we want mm -hmm. them to represent, you're right? All. So if they're pro-police, and we know that that's an issue. And, and if their legis, I would t I would tell people, well, what is their legislative history? What did what, what's the record? What's their record? You know, what have they voted for? What what have they presented again? But not that false stuff where you start a bill and you write and it's beautiful and we all there going, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Universal preschool. <laughs> and then we get and be like, well, none of our kids, you know. Right, none of my kids. And, and, then, and then they say, because you know, we couldn't use race. Oh, but you could use zip codes. So yeah. don't tell me, and you can use zip codes, you yeah. know, and you can use, you know, federal poverty. And level. they use race all the time. They just don't want us to. Right. So, well, what they use is language, which yep. is different. Yep. 
And so it's really, we got to make sure we're home accountable. You got to follow that. Again, I've seen so many times, you know, and then everyone's riled up and everyone's like, well, didn't we have a bill? And, or didn't we have an ordinance? You know, even when we look at the city council and the city council says, yes, go do that. What people don't understand, all they voted for was just to approve the program creation, the staff still has to figure out how to do it and we think we you know we're clapping and we're done we're done <laughs> but then you have to be meeting with the staff you have to let those elected officials know that 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 hasn't we saw that with advanced peace it wasn't moving it was like sitting there and it wasn't moving and then you know a bunch of folks you know black lives matter had to come up and say where the hell is this and so we have mm -hmm. to keep remembering that this political process doesn't stop in november after we cast our vote, the political process is continuous. It's continuous. And it's our a responsibility. Yeah. Like we have a responsibility to participate. Yeah. And my biggest thing, I always say this to everybody, is like we pay for the dysfunction. Our tax dollars go directly to fund for them to, in, to uh, criminalize us, our schools, like all the things that right. we fund that. It's not even like they're using their own money. Like right. they're using our money against us. And if we don't hold them accountable, they'll they'll continue to use our money. And we don't have a choice not to give them their money. Right. You know? I, I applaud y'all for for your efforts, for your work. I was I'm listening to y'all and saying to myself, wow, some of this stuff has to do with ownership of, mm -hmm. of, of, of value of yourself. Because I'm pretty sure other communities don't have to sit and do this. No, no other community has to protect their men, but we do. No other community have to do a gathering like this and say, y'all, we got to have a plan and have all that you really need. Because mm -hmm. I get the money piece, but I think sometimes we put too much on that. When if we're just responsible for each other, yeah. it would just mm -hmm. come rolling when we right. need it. I don't see no other group, Latinos, that's why I don't like the term of color, because it's like, well, what the hell does that mean? Mm -hmm. You know, because we're all, even in all of those colors, there's still this light, dark dynamic that exists. I've been all right. over Latin America. There's right. more Africans in Latin America than there are here. Yeah. Right. But still, I don't always see when they come here that everybody rides our back, but no one helps us up. Mm -hmm. We're and always helping each other. That's right. So how do you propose then? And I just want to throw that well, in. Well, can I just every, add this please, too? Please, and, please. Then, and then, because we want to have that conversation, we're talking about we're separating ourselves from our men. Well, see, I, I'm like, trying to. I, 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 I just, I know, I I just can't. I just don't tell me that we still have to have. Like, we have to validate to you what right. our experiences are. The yeah. data is right. clear. We know what's happening, what's going yeah. on, but we still, and we still yes. have to validate. But I think because we never have a debriefing. I'm just going to go back to the. I think all the horrific things that have happened to black folks, we never sit down and say, "Let's talk about this." You Let's talk, talk about. about what happened when men? I feel like we need to have a debriefing on the crack era. I so I'm serious because I feel like a lot of stuff is like, here go crack. Yes. Like, you know what I mean? You did 25 years in prison, yes. but you did not come and make an amends to your community. Yes. You went to prison for not paying taxes for all that dang money. Right. But you didn't come back and say, I feel so bad about my community. Let me step up. Let me. Right. I mean, some people do, yeah. very small number, but I think we just haven't had a debriefing because that literally cracked us in half. Now we're still picking up pieces. That's true. And let me just say this okay. about separating ourselves. <laughs> we don't need permission. Hello. Mm. Thank you. Better you. tell it. Period. Oh. I agree. <laughs> it's like when your big mama say something, you'd be like, okay. And I don't think we need to we're not gonna be apologetic about making sure that our issues are at the forefront. Because like, our issues yeah. being at the forefront will empower the community. And that's what we all know. Like, we <laughs> all know this. Like the impact that the woman, the black woman right. had on her whole entire family right. and community. Right. We already know that. I mean, the crack epidemic exposed that right. big deal, yes. right? Yeah. right? But we still have to have that conversation. Must not. Right. right. <laughs> But well, I not. think that. But I just say that is also something that we have to that we experience. Right. That other groups I don't think they have, have to have that not conversation. Not to the degree, not to no. the degree that we have. That's just no, honest. no, and I mean because you know let's be honest, we're the most marginalized communities yes. than any other and group. Disrespected. And and so <laughs> you know having a discussion you know is always good, but having a plan is always better. better. Yeah. I agree. 
So, you know, I believe in, you know, plan your work, work your plan. Right. And I think that we just have to get to the point of that. All right. Well, we know talking about it has not gotten us very far. Asking people, you know, to help hasn't gotten very far. So we just need to make sure that our work and our efforts are aligned and that we are all you know, connected in a meaningful way. And it doesn't mean that we're going to all agree on the solutions, but That's at least problem. we can all agree on let's put something forward. Right. You know, because otherwise we are just sitting there going round and round about what's the right solution. There really isn't a right That's solution really because you still got, you know, opportunities to improve just by putting the energy in the right place. So That's if you're right. talking about the achievement gap for African-American kids, Education Trust West did a report, Black Minds Matter, a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and that report, is, you know, has been sitting there, and I, I challenge everyone to, you know, read that report, because I think it gives you some insight around what our kids are experiencing in the public school system. So then when someone is asking you how do you know, what do you think about charter schools? You don't automatically go, oh, no, no, I don't support charter school because you don't even know what the current state of public schools are and what's yeah. happening with our children in public school. So you can't automatically discount this other option if you can't if you don't even know that our then, kids are failing the option and that how they are we using things to our advantage right right i think we're always in this argument whether this is better or that That's is better, better but we need to have the strategic conversation of how this is going to improve right. our communities right and affect our children our children exactly because again i want to keep reminding the school the current my grandmother is so funny because she told my son you know so we're talking about that's her great-grandson and he said, she says, well, how's school? And he said, well, I have a biology test. She said, y'all still doing biology? Because <laughs> she said, I did biology. <laughs> and it's just like, did it change? And it's like, but that well, is the well, Let's be clear, too. They're still reading The Kill of the kill kill Mockingbird. My, my 14 year, my 15 year old just read it last year. I last am appalled. <laughs> so, so, in 2018, so, that these but babies that, have to still read but that. But think about oh, that. So, if, you know, when you think about when my grandmother was going to school, we weren't even, you know, they didn't want us in school. And many of them didn't even finish, you know, the sixth grade. And this is the same system that our kids today are in. And I have a kid, one that is just a genius that, you know, can just way too smart for itself. The other is a genius, but he has a learning difference. So he has dyslexia. And so there's all these barriers that he experiences trying to maneuver through this learning. And it really is because it wasn't created for people, really for tall. kids that think differently. It wasn't created for us, number one. At all. And the other part of it, it was also created as a holding space for the workforce. It was. It was created as a training uh, space yes. for the workforce. Yep. Because if you think about, this, yeah. about the manufacturing, yeah. we were manufacturing. Because they was killing too many people, <laughs> burning them out too quickly. So they said, let's, let's wait on right. have this group and we have a Flow. Right. <laughs> and then if you just think about school structure, you have mm. rows and columns. And or, originally, mm. yeah. you know, the kids, they would hand something to the first kid in the first row, the first column. And then his job was to pass it back. Yep. That's manufacturing. That's understanding how you yeah, yeah. connect with the person a by a straight line. line. All that stuff. Mm -hmm. All those things is educated. Those are the same way we set rooms up today. Those are the same way. So my point is that there's I'm not saying all public school is bad. I'm not I saying all charter school is good. What I'm saying is that with the right information, we can make the right choice for our children and say which environment will they succeed in. And remember, charter is public. And so it's not, it's no different. But when someone like Fortune schools um create schools that Black kids are succeeding. Black and brown kids are succeeding. We should say, oh, that's awesome. People talk about Sac High. 84% of the kids in Sac High go to four-year colleges. The kid, the school my kid goes to in the beige community, only 48% of kids go to four-year schools. Mm -hmm. But when you hear the, the narrative of Sac High, you're like, I'm going to send my kids to Sac High. But they're succeeding. They're sending more kids ready for college than the public school is. Fortune is, send, is going to, when they get to that stage of there, they'll probably send more to, not because they've 
drastically change the way they're educating is because they're adding some elements that right. make kids succeed better. And there's some concentration. There's some concentration on that. On that. And so that, that's all we're saying is the data will help us really start looking at those examples to say, okay, well, this isn't working. Our kids aren't reading at three and they can't even do fifth grade math. How are they going to meet Common Core in the 12th grade? Mm -hmm. So Why do we have Common but Core that, anyway? Right. And then, and then when we think about it, they have all these scholarships available for children of color, right? whole bunch of scholarships. However, if they're not meeting A through G, they're not going to qualify because, right, again, yeah. that's downstream. We're talking about how can we impact upstream so that downstream isn't so bad. As we wrap up healing, how do you propose that black women get a little bit more healing? We just love on each other. <laughs> we take trips. We take trips. <laughs> no, I'm real talk. Right, take trips. You take trips. Go to spa. Yeah, take trips. But and even job. then, you know, like there's black women, black women run. There's, you know, sister circle, Sacramento sister circle, girl track. Girl track. Hundreds I mean, unit. The hundreds we'll be performing unit. tomorrow at Cal Expo. See, <laughs> there are 30. Especially, and that, you know, here in Sacramento, there's all those one things. But those are some same um, organizations that are also in other parts of the state as well and it's just finding a sister circle that match yeah. see I stopped having people around me that's causing me more trauma I just decided whether it's family or friends yeah and I don't yeah. care how long they've been my friend <laughs> they just had to go yeah I don't no care problem. if they were my family and my blood because what that was doing was creating mm -hmm. negative energy in a limited space of time mm -hmm. so if I only got such a limited space <laughs> of time no as a single black mom, I sure don't want to spend that in a with somebody that I don't even like just because we related, right? That's real talk. So then <laughs> we have to now figure out how do we fill that space with positive, you know, so we do uh, we do all kinds of stuff. So we do women, we do a quarterly meeting with black women at at sometimes at my house, sometimes Sandra Poole will come. And we just have people just come and we not there's no agenda. We just have food. We laugh. Yeah. We we talk about, you know, just uh, each other. We talk we <laughs> we share stories. I think it's exposing ourselves to a lot of things, like not subscribing to what black women don't do. Yeah. You know, that's when she travels. Circle. But yeah. like we travel, <laughs> we we work out, right. we um go have fun, we go dance, like yeah. we karaoke. Do, we go down the river, like yeah. whatever, right. like just do some things and get outside of your your box, right? Expand your horizons, right. expand your circle. Your circle. Yeah, right. like I don't do best friends. Like I got a whole bunch of friends. Right. So when I want to go different places, like you too, world, I'm mm -hmm. like you have different people around the world that you can call and call in the pond and right. look up to, and you just have to expand your horizons. I think that's yeah. really where and stop thinking like how we've been socialized to think that, oh, okay, so you go to school, you graduate, you get married, you have kids. Like, that didn't work out for me, actually, and a whole <laughs> lot of other people. There's other things that we can do as women. That's true. So let's go ahead and do them. Right. Yeah, and not let that be how we're defining success. Right. So, you know, yes. it isn't, like, again, if, if we're spending so much of our energy trying to get 70-something percent of women to find, you know, some wonderful black men, because let me again say black women, <laughs> over 90 percent of black women only marry black men and only 85 percent of black men marry black women. But the reality is, you know, that that doesn't that doesn't complete us in yeah, that, that. And if that's not our reality, it's not for anything for us to look as a a bad thing, you right. know, it's actually for us to get an opportunity to say, where can I spend my energy elsewhere? Yeah, you know, do some door and door knocking. Knocking. <laughs> right. And listen, <laughs> and, we, and, I, and we all, you know, like companionships and relationships. Yes. So this isn't about, you know, go to Atlanta. Yeah, go, <laughs> black men, right. Go, the go, but you know, like my sister does, she travels in there. She just got back from Korea yeah. uh, a couple of days ago. And I know, you know, and this child here, she's always gone. And so, and you go places. I am not trying to fly over any ocean. So my <laughs> oh, <no>. my reach <laughs> my reach is really limited. So you know, I'll go to like Arizona. Oh, <laughs> oh no, you better have your drink. Right. <laughs> you, you know, I'll be like to Arizona. That's you hit Arizona on something, go. That's, you hit on something that's really key. So I definitely get to travel right. and doing stuff that, that right. you've never done before. That's so awesome. I think the immediate thing is is how you let people into your space. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like I hate when I say I'm gonna do something. Like, How can you afford it? I'm like, get up out of here. Like I, I need you to tell me this time I'm gonna help you do it, but yeah. don't act like I'm limited because you limited. Right. Like, I, I gotta, you know. I think that's like an immediate thing that yeah. everybody that doesn't cost nothing. You got to book no plane ride. Right. It's like you gotta right. start cleaning the house like you with the old closet with clothes. You never know you're gonna fit in. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? It's kind of like being around. I get like, those you know? clothes. Let me just say, <laughs> <laughs> I just give mine away. Right. I, I, like, I need to give them away now. <laughs> <laughs> no, because then I'll shop and read. You know, like Buy the same thing. Right. I'll shop and like, <laughs> I cut that. I just needed one bigger size. <laughs> Just a half a size. Right. <laughs> and then I'll put it next to the one I can't fit. <laughs> so as we wrap up, thank y'all for coming to sit and talk and, and great information. What should we be looking forward to from you all with this with what you're doing, period? Well, we'll be releasing everything at the end of March. Um, and so I think you'll start seeing more and more information coming out. You know, our hope is that, you know, it'll be useful. Um, to many people, and we know it will at least spark conversation from people, and there also will be that conversation that we're expecting that may not be as positive as we wanted to, but again, we're not asking for permission, we're not apologizing, we're just saying in order for us to move forward, we have to do this. Yeah. And then April 15th, the Sacramento Sister Circle is going to have a follow-up meeting, yep. Yep. because the State of uh, Black Women Forum that's happening in March is Statewide. Statewide, right. So at April the 15th, we're going to have a Sacramento Sister Circle meeting, and we're going to actually look at that same information, mm -hmm. and we're going to think about it locally. Yep. Um, oh, because the God. elections are coming up in June right. and in November, and so we want to actually have a local plan right. in action. And we also have a voter guide that we'll have coming out as well that will actually tell, um, give you some insight of candidates and why you should vote for them and what, oh, we're, what that. we're deciding right. to do um, as as a group of black women here in Sacramento. But also just be a part of the Sacramento Sister Circle. Yeah, if you're a black absolutely. woman over the age of 18, please join us online. We have a vibrant um, community online with almost 6,000 members. Um, we also meet once a month um, on Saturday. We're gonna be meeting at the Underground Book, so we're gonna be talking about the art of saying no. <laughs> wow. Yay. Um, and yeah, Unit is, is gonna be at the Black Expo, and please people should go to the Black Expo. There's a lot of different things that are going on in our community and we should just be more a part of it. Right. Let's go to the Black Expo on the, the coming the up. The Black Joy Parade so in Oakland. Yeah. So even though we're wrapping up, a brother did say, how can brothers follow and support? We will let you know. No. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> no, we can tell them just like, like follow our lead. Follow our lead. Yeah, Christy, I like her because even on Sister Circle, if a brother jumps on uh, Sister Circle, and she'd be like, I'm, I kicked him off. This is for sisters. <laughs> like, yeah, I just have to qualify our face. Like, this ain't for you. Right, right. Well, I think black men can, can learn how to take leadership, like, learn how to lead. Let us lead. Like, we can, we are leaders. We've been leaders in our community. You should follow in our lead. And if we're doing something, you know, that you see is good, it can be replicated. Like, I get talks all the time. It's like, well, what, what's happening with the brother circle? Oh, well, that's no, not my responsibility. Y'all really like, need to go do a brother circle, right? And I, I know that they have some things she going on. Brother circle. But, like, fix a, it. A like, just get table. in there, do <laughs> what you need to do, <laughs> handle your right. business, and also be in solidarity with black women. Like, I agree, but I also will add to though that understanding that there are folks in positions that we aren't in and in places that we're not in. So we mm -hmm. will be engaging folks, even folks that don't look like us, if we need to, you know, if I have to go into something and it's not a bill that is being presented by mm -hmm. Holly or Autumn, it's just as important to me to make sure that that bill, that that piece of legislation is successful regardless of who does it, because it will be positive. Well, finding our allies. Yeah, so, this is, so allies. I think what, in a nutshell, is black men can be our allies. That really okay. is what we need right now. We don't need you to create your own space for black women, which is what we heard was an option. Mm. We need you to actually just be our allies so that we can push this agenda for to help the community, you know, and doing we're, we're doing it together, but we're yeah. doing it very differently. differently and I absolutely. think that there is need for spaces for us to do that as black women. Right. There's also times when we need to do it together as a black community. Right. And there's also some times when black men need to be with black men. 
-hmm. And so all of well, those things are necessary know. all at the same time. Right. And that's, um, remember, you know, um, Boys and Men of Color. That's that initiative. That's my brother's Which we people. support it. Right, because Hold guess who had to take them little boys to all y'all mission? <laughs> <laughs> that would be their mamas. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. We sign off. Oh.